Okay. Um, I think it's time to take some questions. Let's see. Um, well, oh, uh, Vert Link asks, when sorting your Legos, do you disassemble and mix the parts from various Lego builds? I did. Um, do you also mix in the non-official Legos? No. No, I don't. In sorting the Legos, it turns out that some folks had given my boys, uh, what is the other, what's the non-Lego, what's the non-Lego, the main one? I can't remember. I know you're yelling at the screen and uh, I should remember. And it'll come back to me in a second. But when you are touching Legos all the time and you touch a non-Lego that could work with the Legos, boy, you can tell like that. Um, what you don't know about poker chips in casinos is that they sound a specific way. And it is really hard to replicate that sound. And it, it actually helps the people whose job it is to work with the poker chips know when they've gotten one that's counterfeit. Uh, and the same goes true. Mega blocks, mega blocks, mega blocks. Look, I, I don't begrudge the fact that they make a product based on the fact that Lego's patent on those pips just expired. That's fine. That's that's commerce. That's totally great. But when you handle non-Lego parts and Lego parts together, you just really get to see the level of um, precision and accuracy that is in Lego blocks. So part of me has just been thinking about Mega Blocks and like I wanted to make a t-shirt that said Mega Blocks not even once. But I don't really feel like that. Like if you want to buy Mega Blocks, you should totally buy and expand your collection with Mega Blocks. That's fine with me. I find them abhorrent, abhorrent, but that's you know, that's just me. That's simply an opinion. So that's why I'm never going to make a t-shirt that says that I don't want to interrupt, interfere with their commerce. I'm just expressing my opinion. That's all. Uh, all right, let's go back to the beginning. Steve Keller says, can you tell us what your top three favorite places in San Francisco are? Hmm. I've been thinking about this a lot because we've been doing, we've been taking Maggie, our dog, to Golden Gate Park on a fairly frequent basis over the last two and a half months. We, we started sequestering about a week before. Me, by we, I mean in my house, we stopped contact and going out about a week before the lockdown. And so we've been taking Maggie to Golden Gate Park and Golden Gate Park is endlessly amazing. It is a, a true gem of a park. I think it's the largest public park in a major urban area. I, I could be wrong about that. Like that could be one of those things that the locals say that's not actually true. Um, but things like places I love in San Francisco. I love Secret Steps. There's a whole bunch of them. On Lion Street and all over the city, there are secret ways of getting around. Oh my God, the steps up to Coit Tower. Uh, some super, super beautiful vistas. There's this house. <laughs> if you go up to Coit Tower and you face east, there is this house with a glassed in deck. And then below that deck is this room that has a commanding view of everything from the Golden Gate Bridge all the way to the San Mateo Bridge. It's kind of insane. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the thing about San Francisco that is so awesome as a city. Uh, I, and I have my issues with San Francisco as a city, <clears throat> but on a physical level, it is a gorgeous place and full of tons of little gems that you just don't know about. Um, there's a whole secret neighborhood up behind UCSF uh, over there off of Parnassus. That's like really cool little little enclave. But then there are plenty of enclaves in the middle of everywhere. Schrader. I mean, if like, yeah, Schrader Street on Halloween is magical. So is Fair Oaks. Uh, so much of what I used to love about San Francisco is gone. I used to love the industrial areas. I used to find it really relaxing to go through the dumpsters down on King Street before the ballpark was there, before UCSF built a whole new city down in Dogpatch, that was a wasteland. There was nothing there. There was nobody there, T literal tumbleweeds. Um, I, I kind of miss that. I mean, I've been in San Francisco long enough that like a lot of things I used to do are not only gone, but the buildings they were in are gone. I did a lot of hanging out in the, up, in the Upper Haight at a friend's house on Rivoli Street in the early nineties. And 
Um, you remember Quentin Cop, our state senator Quentin Cop? He had a son named Brad, and Brad was a good friend of mine back then. Awesome musician, awesome human, a force of nature. And Brad had a place on, on Rivoli Street. And I drove by it the other day because we were heading back from the park, and I was like, ah, oh, I'll make it left on Rivoli and look at look up the old haunt because we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of shenanigans in that house. Gone, gone, or they built they tore it down and built something else out to the street. The one story I remember about Rivoli Street is we were uh, we were driving around in my Volvo one evening, and we passed a dumpster out in front of Japantown Bowl. And Japantown Bowl was throwing out all these bowling pins. So, of course, I opened the back of my Volvo station wagon, and we just sho shoveled in as many bowling pins as we could fit in my Volvo. Given that it was about like one in the morning, we we're like, what can we do with these bowling pins? This is this is the best description of being 23 that I can possibly imagine. So we drove over to Brad's house on Rivoli Street and we set up not 10, but like uh let's see, 10 is uh, right. And then you said we set up like a much bigger triangle of bowling pins, and we were almost done setting this thing up and we thought this was hilarious and it gets like 1 30 in the morning and then one of us tripped knocked a bowling pin and all the bowling pins fell over here's why that's the funniest thing that like ever happened to me up until that moment because when bowling pins fall over you know what they sound like they sound like bowling pins falling over but when you're standing on the corner of Stanyan and Rivoli at 1.30 in the morning to hear that like, that like classic hollow sound of plastic coated wooden bowling pins doing their business, it's so incongruous. It's like the funniest thing that ever happened to you. That wasn't really a, um, that wasn't really a, uh, about three favorite places, but I've, I've been, I've had a lot of time recently to reflect upon the things that I love about the city. Um, I love driving up to Twin Peaks. I love going out to Alcatraz. Uh, I mean, the headlands, I know they've closed them right now, but the headlands are surpassingly beautiful. Um, did I plant any Easter eggs in any of my models at ILM? Owen A wants to ask. Hmm. Yes. Wait right there. I have it. I have, okay, I'm going to run over and see if I can find this thing, and then I'm going to bring it back and show it to you. Damn it, I couldn't find it. Uh, I'll find it and I'll do a show and tell about it. Um, I built Newt and Rune's shuttle for episode one. That's the spider-legged thing that lands on the plaza of Naboo. Um, and I've talked about this before on Tested, but I built that with Larry Tan, um, an amazing and wonderful uh, uh, guide I'm mean, sorry, model maker and guy who uh, shepherded me through my early weeks at Industrial Light and Magic in mid-1998 when I got there to work on episode one. And uh, Larry uh, brought me into the Newton Rune shuttle. I started working on it and then he had to move on to something else. And so I ended up doing all the finished detailing on the loading bay and the opening doors and the ramp. It was some of the first laser cutting I was doing. Uh, and Doug Chang was uh, er, quickly saw that um, I could be self-directed, so he gave me less and less uh, guidance and was just letting me cut loose with some of the some of the detailing, which was again like dying and going to heaven. Um, on the underside, so uh, you only ever see the rear of the shuttle, like from a lateral, like from level with it. And I needed some detail on the underside of the of the doors open, the ramp comes down, and I needed some ceiling detail there. So I added some and I kind of noticed the detail I was adding looked a little like a dancing bear. And so I, I, I leaned into that. And years later, 
uh, Jim Fong, who hired me to build some models for Galoob Toys years later, a couple of years later, um, Galoob Toys made a model of Newton Rune's shuttle. And sure enough, my dancing bear is visible on the underside. Uh, I mean, it's it's not a, it's not like a you know it's not like the Grateful Dead bear. It, it's still like a, a it's imply it's an implication of a dancing bear. But that's what I was thinking about. Um, Cartonero asks, besides Miyazaki's movies, do you like any other anime anime series? Um, I love Metropolis. Uh, Akira is of course seminally important to me. Um, Satoshi Kon, uh, Paprika, holy. Crab, but an amazing film. Paprika is insane and really beautiful. Millennium Actress is another one of his. I got turned on to his work by Tony Zhou of Every Frame's a Painting. Um, those are the main ones. Those are the main ones. I love Ghost in the Shell. I mean, the, the classics. I'm definitely, I'm definitely a fan of the classics. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, Easter eggs, I'm sorting your Legos. Okay, the D Mitch. The D Mitch. I feel like I'm being forced to say something wrong, but apparently not. The D Mitch wants to know. Oh, he says it's my he or she. Uh, it's my 26th birthday, and I have to make some long-term career choices in the next month that to, that could take me all across the country. How do you make big decisions like when you moved out to California? Um, I don't know that I'm going to have advice that's really like germane to your specific situation, but I'll explain what was going on. Uh, I moved to San Francisco in August of 1990. Prior to that, I had been living at home with my parents for about 18 months. So in the, no, for just, just under a year, actually. Right. Because the previous summer, in the summer of 89, I visited San Francisco. Right. That's it. I visited San Francisco. And while I was gone, my landlord checked out had to do some repair in my place. I lived in this fifth floor walk up on Carroll street in Brooklyn next to prospect park eighth, eighth Avenue and Carroll street there. And my landlord um, went into my apartment and it was so, so messy that my landlord wondered if I was actually living there or if it was like a homeless encampment. Um, and then they kicked me out. So I went to San Francisco, right? I went to San Francisco and left like, 10 days before the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, while I was in San Francisco, the Tompkins Square Parks riots happened, that, which was a huge deal. I always, I felt like I was missing the important things traveling across the country. And then I got kicked out of my apartment and then I moved back home. And it's like everybody kind of moves back home for some period of time. It's just, it's like par for the course. And I moved back home and Let's see. I, it was it was lovely moving back home. I think it was less lovely for my parents. I know my mom's watching this right now and she would say, oh, no, it was great to have you back home. But I also remember at one point, my girlfriend at the time, Tara, who's still a good friend of mine, Tara, uh, a friend of hers, got married. Emily got married in England. And so I had saved up some dough and I said to my dad, this is an early 1990, oh, I'm going to head to London with Tara to go to this wedding. And he was like, you know, maybe it was like May. I think it was May. He was like, you know what I hear when I hear that? All I hear is that you're just going to be living with us for another six months. Like, why not use that money to get the hell out? <laughs> he didn't quite say it like that. But as a parent now, I really get where he's coming from. I, I That's totally understandable. Um, so I was living at home. I was still working in the city for a graphic design firm. Um, it's still there. Laura is still there. Uh, anyway, uh, and my best friend at the time, my closest friend, called me up and he was he had been living in San Francisco for about a year. And he was like, listen, I never wanted to live with you and I still don't, but you can't possibly be worse than my current roommate. So you want to move out here and live with me. And the thing is, is that I had 
like I said, I'd spent the previous three weeks, the previous summer in 89, visiting San Francisco. I had visited for the first time the summer before that in 1988. And in 1988, at 21 years old, I thought this is the most beautiful city I've ever seen. And I was standing on the corner of Goff and Lombard, which is like, if you can fall in love with San Francisco on the corner of Goff and Lombard, you're in for a treat, man, because it gets all uphill from there, literally and figuratively. Thank you, everybody. I'll be here all week. Um, so I came out for three weeks to stay with my brother <clears throat> on uh, on 16th Street. And my brother's roommate still lives there in that same apartment. Yeah. Uh, did you really want a story lane? You didn't. You didn't want to walk down story lane. Anyway, um, how did I make the decision? I It just was the right call at the time. I loved San Francisco. I had a built-in place to live. I knew my friend had a nice place over on Broderick Street. Uh, and I moved out and he kicked me out after a year because I was still a terrible roommate. Um, I mean, I was super messy and not very considerate. And I was, you know, myopic like all young human beings can be. Um, just like the, the stars kind of aligned for that. You can recover from any decision. I think that's the thing I'd like to tell you. You're, a two, you're 26 years old. It's your birthday. You're still really young. To be honest, adolescence has only just finished or is still roughing out, smoothing out the rough edges of you. Uh, as they now know, adolescence lasts way into your 20s. And when you're a parent, as I am now, and you see your kids be young adults, you're like, wow, we were such babies back then. But you have time to recover and... You know, if the decision you make isn't the right one, there's time to try another one. I don't, I hope that was helpful. I'm sorry, I went a little too far down the like, dude, talking about the old days. Um, <clears throat> did you ever meet George Lucas? Super Mabio wants to know, what was it like? Uh, I think it's safe to say that everyone who worked at ILM when I was there met George. Um, not frequently, but you met him at the parties. He was there. He was approachable. He he stayed the whole stayed most of the time. And again, you, like you, everybody had everyone who works there worked there when I was there had a story about like having some random conversation with him. He was a delightful person um, to talk to. Uh, I did get to actually uh, be in the art department for episode two for a few weeks, uh, Mark Siegel and I uh, got to join John Goodson and John Duncan in the, the top floor of the big house up at the ranch. And uh, I got to uh, be in a couple of meetings with George as he came in and made changes to the models that we were making. I, Mark Siegel and I built the very first um, foam core mock-up of the arena from episode two. Um, super focused super, super, super focused. Um, uh, the very first time I met him, um, we knew he was coming up for a meeting. Rick McCallum came first and George came up the stairs and they were uh, just looking at uh, uh, Walking with Dinosaurs had, uh, had aired on television the night before and they were looking to hire some of the animators from that. So that was the first part of the meeting was Rick's uh, fast forwarding through Walking with Dinosaurs and George going, whoever animated that, let's hire them. Um, you know, for whatever you think of the movies, for whatever you think of some of the movies versus others of the movies, the fact is he, George gave an amazing gift to our culture uh, with Star Wars franchise and continues to. I, I loved watching all the behind the scenes stuff on The Mandalorian and seeing how present he is with Favreau and Filoni and, and all the directors. Um, that feels right. I mean, and I mean, that feels right. I mean, the Mandalorian itself feels right. And when you look at the mood that was clearly going on behind the scenes of kind of some, a real love fest for the, for the original material um, from the creator, as well as all of these directors interpreting it, it was lovely. Um, and when you go to a party, especially at the ranch, I went to one party there. <laughs> I brought my twins when they were eight months old. Uh, Yes, no, five months old, five months old. They'd been born just a few months prior. And when the 4th of July party happened up at the ranch and I pulled up in the car and I was like, here's my invitation. And the guard was like, the invitation's for two people and there's four of you in the car. And I'm like, these are babies. They're not going to eat anything here. And I promise they will never touch the ground while they're here. And they're like, mm -hmm. 
Uh, all right, you can go in. So you're sitting there in the ranch with all your fellow employees and their spouses, so like 3,000 people, and it still feels expansive and quiet. And you just, any time you spend up at the ranch looking around, you just, I think to myself, man, I'm not thinking big enough about the world. Because George took a one movie and built all that. Like, for real. That's that's a real, real thing. So it's like, it's easy to make fun of some of the stuff involving the movies. And I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. But <clears throat> mad respect to the dude. Uh, it was it was heady and delightful to be in a couple of meetings with him. Um, thank you for your book. Uh, Ratafract asks, thank you for your book. The concept of mistake tolerance has been life-changing for me. Do you have any tips on self-forgiveness for absolute failures, though, not for just mistakes? Um, let's parse that question for a second. Absolute failures, like you lost a friend because you screwed up because you really boned something or you lost a job for the same reason. Um, things where the course of your life or somebody's life was changed by your mistake. Um, all of those have happened to me. Do I have any tips on self-forgiveness? Man, I'm as bad at it as anybody else. Uh, you know, I, I try and remember. There are things I try and remember. I try and remember that time will make this feel better. I try and remember that everybody goes through this, that nobody escapes. Um, it's, it, it's that simple and that's the hardest damn thing that there is. It is that simple. Um, tips, it would be, it would be improper for me to give tips for self-forgiveness because I, it's, it's, we're all terrible at it. it. It's not easy to do. It's, we're our own worst critics, right? And we know deep in our hearts exactly how jealous and venal and lazy we can be. <laughs> and, when you screwed up, the only thing you can do is resolve to, as I said it in the book, the only thing you can do is resolve to not replicate that same set of circumstances again. And that's real. And the people that you love, they see that. Like that's, I'll, I'll say this, um, Heinemann and I in our association, in our long association, had lots of highs and lows. And there were times we just felt super glowy about each other and times we wanted to plunge a pen into each other's necks. Uh, but one of the things I will give it up for, for that guy, and he said the same to me, that we both had this quality of like, something's not working and you bring it up and you talk about it between the two of you. Uh, he would change. He would, he would alter his behavior. He'd hear what I was saying and like adjust a bit. Um, that's the thing. You're not going to avoid the mistakes, but the real shitbirds in the world, the people that the toxic people that you just don't want to deal with are the ones who are just going to continue to do the same thing to you every single time. So the very fact that you're like asking questions about how to process an absolute mistake is progress. Because there's a whole bunch of people who don't. I'm thinking of one right now. Look, being able to process your mistakes and learn from them is, that's another thing that I think of as being a person. But not everyone thinks that. Uh, and that's real. Um, okay. Dan UCF fan says, Blade Runner. I've never watched it all the way through. I know. I'm sorry. Which version would you suggest as the quintessential version to watch? That's a good question. I mean, I'm inclined. My, my inclination is to say, watch it, the original release, the American release with the voiceover and 
the happy ending. Because that's the version that it feels like the right one to me, but that's only because that's the one I grew up on. I love the final, final director's cut. I love Ridley Scott's cut that has no narration. Um, it's beautiful. The unicorn shot uh, st still bothers me just the tiniest bit, but it's, it's tiny, tiny. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm picking nits. Uh, the final director's cut is the final cut is brilliant. And actually there is a reason to watch the original theatrical release and then to watch that one because it's quite educational. It was to me to notice in the theatrical cut, Harrison Ford is narrating all sorts of stuff. Sushi. That's what my ex-wife called me. All of those little speeches, that feeling in me for her, what was happening to me, all that stuff. I don't mind the narration because I, I mean, that's the, that's the version I grew up on, but when the narration is gone, I went and watched it at the opera house theater. And when, when it came out and I felt like I was seeing a brand new movie and I'd seen Blade Runner like dozens of times, but there's a way in which when someone's talking at you, your brain shuts off some of the visual faculties in order to process the language narration there were aspects of the film I could see. Also, there's all these shots in the spinner when Gaff and Deckard are flying around. There's more of those shots in the final cut and they're beautiful. And there's, I don't know, there's, there's, it's the place in which Ford seems the most unlike Harrison Ford. Um, not that that's a good or bad thing, but there's a way in which he seems sort of young and the character is not sure what's gonna happen. And that's so extant in the scene and the way that he and almost are playing it. I just, I love, love, love those scenes. Yep. But also the compromise cut is super thrilling and weird and awesome. Look, the, basically the, 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 the DVD set of all of the versions is an education in film. There's, there's a lot to learn from seeing small and large iterative changes to something that you love. Um, Ev the Nerd asks, what was your favorite project with your kids? So um, one of the one of the very few magazine covers I did back in the days of Mythbusters was I did a cover story for Wired. They were doing a geek dad issue, and I was the cover cover guy. And um, they the 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 uh back then was that chris anderson or scott datich who was running it back then i think it was scott i remember at any rate they uh they called me up uh it was either chris or scott and said hey uh we'd like to do a geek out episode what stuff have you done with your kids we'd love some of the projects and i was like i am a terrible dad i haven't built very much stuff with my kids at all and they're like well have you built anything with them they're like yeah like three things and then I described them to him, and they were like, great, put those in the article. <laughs> I had a friend who wrote to me, and he was like, thanks for making me look like a bad dad. And I'm like, those are literally the only three things I built with them. Um, I built a hovercraft with them. After we built the hovercrafts on Mythbusters, I brought the boys over to, the, to Jamie's shop one weekend, and we built a hovercraft together. That was a lot of fun. Um that was maybe the most fun thing we did together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, later on, each kid has been over here to the cave to make something uh, that they needed. And I give guidance, but I'm also a bit of a hard task master. master. I, I, you know, I want them to figure it out. And so I show them how to use the tools safely and then I let them screw up. It's like, that's how you, that's how you do it. Um, and both are, 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 really intuitive makers uh, of different stripes than I am. Uh, but they both have the ability to put something in their head and render it out with their hands. Um, and that's really neat. It's neat to watch happening. It's it's fascinating having a relationship with adult children. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do you decide when to throw out stuff, whether it's material or other stuff? No cave is a TARDIS where space is infinite. I have this problem from time to time. Yeah, I throw out a lot of stuff. 
but still it's a process, right? Uh, when I need to clear space, I start asking questions, not just about things, but about categories of things. Um, so there's all these, I, like I had the mechanics of three pianos that I've been storing for somewhere around 20 years. Why, 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 why do I need those? They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. I let them go to a local artist, but why did I need to store them? If I really needed the mechanics to a piano, that is something that I could go get that they, they exist. You can purchase those. You could buy a junk piano. You can go to urban or there's probably two in there right now. And you can just buy them and pull the, pull the mechanics out. Um, that helps inform. So for me, a lot of the stuff I stored was because I had no money and I had to get my materials where I could find them. And so if I came across a dumpster that had some bowling pins in it, I'd grab a bunch because, well, that's a, I could, I might be able to use that. Uh, and I don't need to store everything anymore. I still store weird stuff that I can't easily get elsewhere. But I have been more like stuff that I'd been saving for years for like material usage is like, ah, let's just let that one go. Look, it's a it's a process. I don't have hard and fast rules about it. And right now I, I, I'm moving some stuff around the cabin. I've got to get a bunch of stuff out of here and I'm getting rid of a whole couple of categories up in, in deep storage upstairs. I still never done a, a show and tell up. I mean, it's 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 awful right now. It's all low pipes, bang your head every single time. Um, look, I, I love Marie Kondo's whole ethos of like, does this, do I still need to be the steward of this thing or can I let it go? Um, it's a great question to ask all the time. Sorry. I don't have a really specific answer to that question. It is a good question, but man, it's just, it's a different process for everyone, for everything, for all the places. And yeah, I actually have one less storage space now than I had a year ago because I have been consolidating and I'm still trying to consolidate enough to get rid of the other storage space I have in San Francisco so that I can end up with only one storage space in San Francisco. Yeah, that's how bad it is. I also have a storage space in New York. I've got to get that stuff out here at some point. Yeah, someday. Um, <clears throat> Joseph Jordan says... Lego question. Do you keep the boxes and instructions for sets? Do you keep them in put together mode or do you ever disassemble? I do not keep the directions. I think I throw them out about as fast as I build the kit. I toss the box too. I don't keep boxes for things. Uh, when I buy new electronics, I'll hold onto the box for a few weeks just in case I have to ship it back because something went wrong. But um, no, and in the Lego sort, I went through the collection of assembled Legos that I had and I disassembled a couple. I don't need the flat iron building. I don't need that flat iron building. So I took it apart and distributed among the various color categories. Um, uh, and that felt weird. I have not done that before. That this is the first time I've dismantled a kit specifically for the express purpose of spreading it among the collection. Um, but it's a good thing to do. Like, th th there's, again, it's a great thing you said, no shop is a TARDIS. It's, it's lovely because those of us with shops, we wish they were TARDISes. We really do. It would be so delightful if you could put an infinite number of things in it. Would it be delightful? Would it be delightful? Or would you feel like you're just carrying that chain all the time? That could be the case. Um, all right. Hikari Yamato asks, I recently re-listened to your audiobook, Every Tool's a Hammer. Thank you for listening to it again. I'm really happy with that audiobook. Hmm. By the way, um, before I went and recorded the audiobook, which was super fun, took about 12 hours, 14 hours maybe. Um, Mrs. Don't Try This, my wife, uh, played for me some of Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic. Um, and there's a way in which she reads that book that is really, really neat. It's almost like ASMR, AMSR, ASMR. You know what I mean? Um, it's, uh, uh, it feels like she's 
it feels like she's almost like talking in your ear. It's really nice. It's very, it's very intimate and it's very, um, it feels like an audio hug to a certain extent. And she said, I think you should consider recording your book like this. And I agreed. Uh, so we, we really tried to make it sound like a, like a personal experience you were having with me. So I'm glad you really listened to it. But you had a question. And the question is, what would you say was the easiest and hardest parts of the book mentally to plan out and write about? Oh, my God. Writing a book, <clears throat> there's no ease. Everything about it was super hard. Everything about it was a slog. Uh, 90,000 words, give or take, 100,000 words. It's a lot of, lot of stuff. Um, it was really hard to figure out what to illustrate and what to not. What to like? What to include photos with and not? I I went overboard on the photos. The editorial paired me back, and I'm totally fine with the pictures that are in the book. Um, as far as the storytelling, I really there was no part I found harder than any other part. It was just the robustness of telling stories at that depth for a book, so that they really resonated the material have some cohesion across across the length of these stories that was really tough um there were chapters like the glue chapter that came together very quickly at the beginning and then the problem is my the problem is my material knowledge is very specific and while i am a generalist that means that there's very few things i really know a lot about Right. I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I know a lot about just a few things. And glue is one of those ones in which I had a real trouble. So first I started by writing out about all these different glues. And then I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm starting to do research glues I don't even use to talk about them. Why would I write about things that I don't use? And that's when I understood the frame that I should be taking, which is here's the glues I use. And if I had to choose five glues, here they are. And here's why I like them. Here's their limitations. Here's the way I think through them. The glue chapter was a sea change in my understanding of how to write about my own personal authority and point of view about material science and the engineering that I do. Uh, because I'm very careful not to pretend to be an authority about stuff I don't know about uh, or to give caveats to the stuff that I do feel like I have some, some point of view on. Um, and to be honest, my, the, the, the team I had working with me on the book was phenomenal. Um, and they made the process a lot easier. Uh, the people at Atria. Yeah. Um, but man, that was a slog. I, look, I have another book. I want to write another book. I've got a reasonable outline in my head and, uh, at some point I'm going to take it out and pitch it. But, um, but right now, I, 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 it was like a couple of years getting that book across the line. A lot of stress. Felt like a homework assignment that never ended. And I, I told my wife, I'm like, you know, I've got another book. She's like, really? You want to go back into, <laughs> you want to go back into that room, into that slog? Because they kicked your ass. And I'm like, yeah, no, it really did. And yet, I feel like I have more to say. So there, there will be a. I think there will be another one at some point. Um. Tom Tarn says, how often do you get recognized and stopped in public? Well, now, now, now I'm like, I, I, I don't get recognized at all. We're all covered with masks, man. There's no fame anymore. <laughs> uh, plus, it's been a long time since I've been on television. So even before the lockdown, it only happened, um, I don't know every two or three days. I'm pretty ubiquitous in this neighborhood. I'm around, I go to all the places. Everyone kind of knows me. It's not that, it's not that special. I'm not that special. <laughs> um, I did have someone recognize my one wheel the other day. I was riding and they were going the opposite way. And I saw them see the one wheel and realize that it had to be mine. And they looked up and they saw my hat. And even though I was wearing a mask, they could tell that it was me. That was fun. Um, Iron Wheaties asks, I know a ton of people are digging into, digging deep into home improvement during quarantine. Has the same happened for you? Or are you satisfied with making things that you already would have been making? Oh, no, 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 no. I've been doing some home improvement. In fact, a uh, one day build that's coming up soon involves a bonafide piece of furniture that I made for the house. 
and it was re- they're like I I can't wait till this one goes up because you haven't seen me make things of this stripe before. Um, I was not trying to make like a beautiful piece of furniture. I was trying to make something that was aesthetically pleasing, but I was really I was really trying to solve a problem about an area in the house where stuff happened. And it was like, you know, like in your foyer where you take off your coat and you put your hat, you should have some hooks, right? For the coat and the hat. And if you don't, you might put them up. And that's the kind of improvement this piece of furniture I built was. It was for entering the house and for holding on to some things. Um, And again, I wasn't interested in making a piece of furniture that was like, hey, look at me, I'm a beautiful piece of furniture. I wanted to make a kind of a boring piece of furniture notice but that fit really well with the house and that was a super interesting tack to take i also uh did real woodworking i did real mortise and tenon joints for it i clamped it and glued it and it's real that piece of furniture will last for a lifetime uh it's well made i'm if i say so myself i even cut the uh uh I even did some of the cutting on the milling machine and woodworking with a milling machine feels like cheating, man. It's so awesome. Uh, So no, I have been doing some home improvement. I'm also working on our garage because we have a ton of crap in there that we don't need to have in there. Um, We are just uh, two adults who ride bicycles. So why do I have four bicycles in the garage? We can move two of them over to storage, which is going to happen soon. Um, so, yeah, in fact, actually, the house is better organized now than it has ever been. And that feels lovely. Um, you know, you get into routines in your living space. You get into your routines. You you, you occupy the same parts of your living space, right? And sometimes that feels like, uh, sometimes it feels like you're in a rut. For me, that sometimes it can feel like you're in a rut. And a couple of years ago... Uh, my wife pointed out that we were underutilizing a, a part of our living space. And so we sort of engendered a, we moved where our bedroom was and it, just that simple thing kind of changed our lives and made us feel much more like we're inhabiting the whole space that we live in. And that feels really lovely. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very lucky. I, I, I'm very happy with our house and really love it. And I, I have a deep, like affection for it, right? And it's it's a it's a lovely space, and I'm incredibly lucky to have that. Uh, it is a real privilege, um, and yeah. So home improvement, absolutely. I've actually was noticing um, we have on the side of our house we have some planters full of plants, and they're irrigated, uh, and they drain into the side of the house and the floor drain out there. And what that means is that after the, over the 10 years that we've been there, the, the, where the irrigation runoff goes down is a path of like lichen green and brown and all of that. And it's basically ripe for a pressure washing video um, like those ones on Reddit uh, all the time. Uh, so I was thinking, ah, maybe I got to call Jamie up and borrow his pressure washer and uh, do one of those videos of pressure washing the side, the sidewalk on the side of my house. Um, Mad Coinage asks, what is the earliest prop project that you have kept around? I'll show it to you. Give me just a second. I'll be right back. I think I did a show and tell of this on testing. If I did, when we break this out, we'll, uh, we'll include that. Um, this right here is one of the earliest things that I, the earliest physical objects that I made. Um, I made this in shop class in seventh grade. In seventh grade, I was 12 years old. Yeah, give or take. Uh, I was 12 years old, so that would be 1970, 70, uh, 79. Yeah. And I wanted, I, I grew up on the Little Rascals. They were on all the time when I was a kid. And they, there's this whole episode in which they're driving around in a Model A Ford and hitting people with a boxing glove uh, on the end of a big uh, uh, accordion arm like this. And I wanted to make such a thing. And so the shop teacher showed me how to do it. I, these are hammered rivets. Um, and as you can see, my hole spacing is terrible. But... Uh, 
Yeah, I still have this thing. Um, this isn't the oldest thing that I have. Hold on, wait, I do have one older. Yeah, okay. So this is from, hold on, let me just um, see here. Uh, as uh, if you're not familiar with my with my past, my father was a painter, um, and this is a piece of art that I made. I was six years old, and notice that my dad actually signed it for me by Adam Savage, April 1973, Portrait of Jingle. Jingle was my teddy bear, um, and here is Jingle. This is my portrait at six years old of Jingle. Um, this was made. While I was supposed to be napping, I snuck downstairs out of the house into my dad's studio, which was uh, the modified two-car garage behind our house, and I traced my teddy bear onto a piece of construction paper, and then I gave him all the things that I aspired to, which was a cool vest, a gold belt buckle, and a Superman shirt. And then I wrote my name here. No, I wrote his name, Jingle. G G L E Savage S on the bottom A V I G Savage. This is like the spelling equivalent of talking with your mouth full. This is what I could achieve in at six years old. Um, but bless my parents for saving this. I, I still have it. I wrote a whole article and uh, I had a column for Wired Magazine a few years ago, and this was, I think, the very first column I wrote for them was about Jingle here. Um, this. You can never go wrong saving some of your early stuff uh, or even just taking pictures of it. Yeah, those are the those are definitely the two oldest pieces I have in here. Andrew Barth. Hey, Andrew. How's it going? Andrew Barth has a question. Is there any project you've been putting off for years waiting for the right opportunities to come together? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. And there's one I'm still dying to do, man. Uh, I am the um, obsessed and uh, delighted owner of a 1982 Toyota Land Cruiser BJ42 diesel, uh, right-hand drive. I love this car so much. Uh, during lockdown right now, Thing 2 is driving it, and uh, he's pretty happy about that, as any young human being would be to drive such a fun car. Uh, but come on, it can't be too long before diesel is just outlawed, right? I mean... We got to stop driving gasoline cars. That's that's totally clear. So I want to I want to uh, electrify the Land Cruiser. I want to electrify the Land Cruiser and I want to film the whole process. It's an expensive process. I've looked deeply into it. I've talked to experts. I've talked to all sorts of different folks. Uh, Brand Farron and Danny Hillis and the CTO of Ford and Simone and yeah, all sorts of great people have consulted with me about electrifying this cruiser and I've still never gotten around to it. Uh, but Someday soon, I'm going to electrify that thing. Absolutely, it's going to get electrified. That That's definitely one. Um, thank you, Andrew. It's good to hear from you. Let's see. <clears throat> M Mr. 6507 asks, what is your start and end of day procedure for the shop? I always see all the lights on and individual tools. Do you flip one big breaker at the end of the day? Yes, I do. I have... Um, a lot of these are on uh, some sort of modified X10 system or something like that, like the home automation. I have them plugged. I have all a lot of these individual lights. Some of them are these like four watt LEDs. I just leave them on. Um, but over at the front of the shop, there is both a master switch for the fluorescence and then a, a, a remote that turns off all the lit cabinets and uh, and a lot of the smaller lights. Um, Bubble Factory asks. What do you feel are the pros and cons of having your shop in a separate location from your shop, from your home? This is a great question. Mm. Um, pros. There are no cons to having a shop close to my home. Honestly, I love having a shop close to the house. I love it even more than having the shop in the house. I have had shops in my house. I prefer a shop that's outside my house, but close by. Uh, 
the, there's no cons to honestly um this place is like I, I breathe here, right? This is like, this is, this is where I inhale the world and exhale my thoughts about it. Um, and ha it's only a few blocks from my house here. And that's, that's, oh my God, I feel so lucky to have that. Um, I feel so lucky to have that, especially at this time where I can come and have something to do. Uh, yeah, there's not really, look, having a shop in your house is amazing. And if I had a giant house, I would love to have a shop in there. Uh, but I don't, uh, The cons of having a shop in the house are worth talking about because when I first had a shop in the house and I had kids, I thought, well, this is great. I can be down here all the time and yet I'm still home. So I can kind of do both things. And the answer is no, you can't. No, when you're raising kids, you got to either concentrate on raising kids or you got to be not concentrating on raising kids. There's no half concentrating on raising kids. Um, so the house, the, the shop in the house didn't really afford me more time in the shop. In fact, I found more time in the shop when I put it away from the house. It's a, there's, a, there's more to discuss here than I can really go into at this moment. Not, not because there's like personal details I don't want to reveal, but it's a, it's a sort of long arc of my discovery about the levels of consciousness about wanting to work in here and also being part of your house and being part of your family. Uh, every, every, everybody struggles with that balance of life and work. And so have I, and so do I. Um, but interestingly, I have found having the shop outside the house to be a real boon. And it's really nice that those two spaces are separated. And even during the short journey I make from here back home at the end of each day, um, that journey allows me to transition to being home. It allows me to put my head in the space of being in my house and seeing the people that have been there all day and wondering what life is like for them and interacting with them for the rest of the evening. Uh, I find that to be a real grace and I like that. Okay. Last question. 90 minutes already, man. This goes so freaking fast. Um, Nate P says, is there a silver lining that could come from this pandemic as it pertains to the maker movement? Yeah, totally. There are, there are so many potential silver linings to this. And by silver linings, let's be clear. Like, if something's going to kill hundreds of thousands of earthlings, it is incumbent on us to see what utility could come from that, right? Like that's honoring the dead, like for real. The maker movement specifically has been remarkable. Uh, the number of different maker shops and makers, the number of tens of thousands of 3D printers around the world making PPE uh, and helping to solve problems that uh, frontline workers and other people suffering for all sorts of different reasons from the lockdown. Um, and it has been the maker's moment. And that's been really, really inspiring. Uh, all the potential that was in all of these amazing devices, the Prusas of the Glowforges, all of the different pieces of equipment that are so amazing, that have so radically changed uh, the approach to making over the past decade and a half, uh, have really sort of met their moment at this point in time. And uh, I think that's a great boon. I think that's really important and good. Um, it's it, what's about to happen to the economy is really scary. And I say that like, I, like there's, I don't know what's going to happen to the economy. I have no idea that in and of itself is freaking terrifying. So what economy, what, 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 what grows up in the place of what we have lost? because we've lost a lot and we're going to continue to lose a lot. Uh, it's not lost on me that like, you know, the regular, the regular bootstraps crowd is like, everyone should have six to eight months of savings to weather a bad, a bad occurrence. And if you don't, it's your own fault that you got evicted from your apartment. Meanwhile, the airline industries was like begging for dough two weeks after the lockdown started. 
so apparently uh, that like that bootstraps, you should have six to eight months of savings doesn't apply to corporations. That's ridiculous. There's an aspect to the lockdown that provides a really interesting societal control to me. By that, I mean, it allows us to look at things from a perspective we would have never gotten under any other circumstance. And it behooves us to learn from that. So uh, uh, as a point of comparison, when they stopped all planes from flying for two weeks after 9-11, um, weather scientists got this incredible set of data from having no contrails in the air for a few weeks. And they were able to really see exactly the effect that airplanes and other modes of travel were having and compared them because they were able to get a control against their data sets. This is, that's for a scientist, that's fantastic. Uh, and the same thing is happening here. Um, I hope that we never again have to have the debate about working productively from home. Just as I hope we never have any more debates about, are you really reading when you're listening to a book? Go argue that with a blind person. Uh, yeah. So I say that by the reason I bring up uh, the maker movement in, in relation to the control that the, that the lockdown provides us societally, culturally, humanity wise, um, is that the, the, the biggest promise to me of the maker movement over the past 10 years, the thing that I've been most excited about is the idea that the, the continual lowering of the threshold to entry for making beautiful and interesting things is a net good for society. And the better this equipment gets, the more we get deeper and deeper individual views on what things should look like. Um, and when we can print metal, all of a sudden we're going to have the most amazing kitchen utensils ever when cheap metal printing becomes something you could purchase on a desktop. I know there's a few models out there, but I'm like talking on a, you know, with the, when, when metal printing is as ubiquitous as current, uh, 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 as current printing is in plastic. Um, I like the idea of a world in which I could buy my next iPhone, uh, case from a kid down the street. Uh, and get their point of view and collaborate with them on 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 that product. Uh, I might have talked about this on this broadcast a few weeks ago, but um, when I was in the, in the, at the end of the Obama administration, I was doing a lot of work with Tom Khalil and the Office of Science and Technology, uh, helping promote making around the country. And I visited a place called the Elizabeth Forward School where the, a teacher there had been given a bunch of 3D printers and told, start a 3D printing um, class. And she worked with the young women who, who went to that school. And over the course of a year, they figured out how to use the 3D printers. And then she took them across the street to a assisted living facility where each student uh, adopted, uh, took on as charge, uh, one of the residents of the assisted living facility and then spent that year iterating something to make to improve the life of that resident. I saw a lot of inspiring things when I was traveling around the country visiting maker spaces. Um, I've been to the shop where, 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 where Meow Wolf builds their things, man. The, the, uh, Artisans Asylum. There's been some incredible groups of enthusiasm that I got to visit. But there were few things that I found more moving than this incredible teacher uh, inventing out a whole cloth, like one of the greatest lesson plans I've ever heard in my life to, to adopt the resident of assisted living facility and iterate a product that improves their lives. Um, and that to me, the reason I find it so moving is that it is using the technology to answer a specific, uh, a specific need in a specific moment, which is what the maker movement has been doing during the lockdown. And I hope that the economy that we build post this uh, continues to accommodate that because I think when we train a generation of digital natives to make things based on their point of view, the more people in a culture that are doing that, the better and more vibrant that culture is. That's, that's how I feel about it. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me for this. I really, I every week I look forward to it uh, and I, I appreciate your questions, your feedback, your presence. 
I hope and trust that you and your family are safe and sound and only driving each other moderately bananas. Uh, please wear those masks. Show simple humanity by understanding that you don't wear the mask to protect yourself. You wear it to protect those around you. Um, we're going to get through this if we get through it together. And I will see you guys next week. Thanks for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Bye, guys.